Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 375 for Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. Greetings, folks. And welcome to, welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include capoapp.com from Super Mega Ultra Groovy. This is, uh, this app gives you song learning superpowers, and we'll talk more in depth about what that means in a little bit. For now, here, uh, back here, uh, as of last night, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, man. So, uh, hey man, welcome back, and welcome back to you too. I think you you traveled up to Portland to see one of your favorite bands, and I traveled down oh, to Mexico yeah. to see one of mine. So, that's fantastic. Uh huh. How was we uh, both were, we were both were living the dream, right? We were living the dream. That you know, truly, uh, yeah. Lisa and I had a great time uh, down in Mexico seeing fish on the beach. Um, I mean, it's hard not to have a great time seeing a band yeah. on the beach. <laughs> and not only that, your favorite band that the two of you love. Well, yeah, it's, it's true. It's, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I it, it is certainly one of my favorite bands. I, I have, I have several that, that sit in that realm for me, but, but Fish is a band that Lisa and I found uh, right after we started dating. So it's kind of been a, a, a thing that's been been there for us both not something that either one of us brought to the relationship and we both are huge live music fans like we've both been seeing concerts since uh, you yeah. know since we were kids and in fact we realized not that long ago that there was a boston concert uh in the band boston they played uh i don't know like eight dates in worcester worcester massachusetts for their third stage tour and it just so happens that long before we ever met, Lisa and I were actually at the same one of those nights together. Which was what was what was Boston like in, in that area as they were coming up? Like, did everybody know this is it? Like, the, they sound as amazing in small venues because I mean that's a, such a huge sound yeah. that you think is benefits from a little space to get the sound out. What I, was it like to? I never saw Boston in a, a small venue. I only ever saw them in in large places. I saw them at the Worcester Centrum. I'm trying to think of where where else I saw them. It would have been New Haven or Hartford or something like that. But you know, hockey rink style places. So you know, but you were aware, like like as they were coming up. What was there a buzz around them, or or were they just kind of like a, no. you know, they skipped the minor leagues and went right to the major leagues? I, I never knew of them in the major leagues. I I didn't grow up. I mean, I grew up you know, four hours from Bo from the town of Boston down in, in Connecticut. I was much closer to New York city than I was to Boston, Massachusetts. So I didn't, I didn't really know of that band uh, until, until they were huge. It broke. Yeah. 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 So I, I, that, yeah. That, as the rest of the world, right. That's Correct. what I'm wondering is like, yeah. did they come up through the club scene? I mean, did they actually do that or did they just, you know, create a demo that was such a unique sounding thing that they skipped the minor leagues and went right to the major leagues. I, I mean, I'm get, I don't know the answer. I'm guessing each of them had their time in the minor leagues. Yeah. Uh, obviously that's sort of, you know, it would be hard not for that not to happen, but, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I was, you know, when they were coming up, I was, I was also fairly young, so I, I wouldn't have been going yeah. to clubs to see, any band, let alone, you know, a band four hours away or something like that, if assuming they were playing around Boston at the time, which would make sense. But I don't know. I When I, I was in high school yeah, and a, and a musician in high school, you were aware of the bands who were that next level, you know, that there was like there was a there was a magazine called BAM, Bay Area Musician, okay. BAM magazine that was around. It was one of those, you know. Yeah, it looks like the looks like the Village Voice, right? The local rag, and, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, they had a, a music awards called the Bammies, and huh. you know a lot of bands on their way. They're like you got bet, the best club band was one of their awards, and sure. You know, you, you kind of watch some of these bands kind of come up through the ranks, and again, clubs were so different then. I mean, totally. clubs were small showcases back then. 
It was right. always small showcase. Yes, yes. What we what what clubs are today is is different from what they were back then. I, I mean, yeah. It, it, it yeah in in that yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah one one that's weird to me, and I I still need to do more research is John Mayer. He grew up two towns over from me, uh, yeah. in Fairfield, Connecticut. He wound up going to the same high school I went to. Now he's younger than me. So I, I would not have seen him at my high school, but we, my school after I'd graduated had this program where kids could come there and then spend a semester in Japan. My sister actually did that. Uh, but, uh, but he participated in that, but I never, I was playing around that area when he would have been playing in clubs and I never encountered him. Like I, I don't think he, he played like the local Southern Connecticut club scene. I think he sat in his bedroom getting better and better with guitar and then would go into Manhattan and play, you know, the occasional showcase here and there. But, but I, I don't, I don't think he wasn't playing around in the club scene, you know, at yeah. that, at that point in time. Cause I, I would have run into him. I was, you know, that's all I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and and yeah. he went to, well, he went to, he went to Berkeley, right? And then he went to Berkeley. Yeah. I believe that's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, the story I hear is he went to Berkeley. He left, I think, after his sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And w I think he was in Atlanta or something like that and locked, literally locked himself in his room. Yeah. And, pra and practiced and wrote songs, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't, he had a different path up. That's right. Yeah. And he, that, he's particularly different because, you know, like there's that whole genre of, like producer discovered guys, but you know, guys who played an instrument and wrote their, that was, that became a little rare about the time that he came up. Right. Yeah, he so, was one of the, one of the sort of, it, of a, I don't want to call it a dying breed, but, but there were more people that were just discovered and given songs and that sort of thing at that time. than there were yeah. just the guy who was like, yeah, I'm going to be a singer songwriter. But yeah, my first real, I mean, I knew about John Mayer, uh, that he, you know, he had some radio hits. My first exposure to him as a fantastic guitar player was, was because of Steve jobs was at an Apple event. Right. When, right. right? I mean, I think it was an event that you had some production in, yeah. involved with. Yeah. But, but uh, for those who don't know when Apple released garage band, they brought Steve brought John Mayer up on stage to uh, sort of be his, his demo boy to play guitar through garage band record, and record a couple tracks. Well, and, and play the different amp simulator sounds and all that stuff. And I remember, you know, he, Steve would just sort of jump from one amp sound to another and John would play a little bit and then he jumped to the next one. And when he got to the one that was just kind of a, a fender twin with a little bit of grit and, and some nice reverb, John started playing and he looked at Steve and he was like, Oh yeah. Keep it on this one for a little while. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Mayer played the iPhone introduction as well. He he actually performed and sang yeah. that. That's right. Yeah, this he was just part of the demo team. But you're right. Yeah, then they had him back to play. But yeah, it's, yeah it, it, Mayor's awesome. I mean, he's he's yeah. an interesting cat. It's it's been interesting to watch his personality transform. At least what he publicly lets people see. Yeah. over the years, but just a monster player, command of in, his instrument, writes cool songs. Just reinvented guitar is really interesting. Yeah. You know, and he's happy. Things. I think he's happy being sideman for the rest of his career. Like I, I don't well, think no, he's on a, he's on a solo acoustic tour right now. Oh, is he now again? Oh, yeah, that's he, right. He Cause just went out. Well, cause dead and company is, is, you know, wrapping things up. So, but, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see him pick up another sideman gig. Like I, mm, I, 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 I don't know. He seems, he seemed to be really into that. Like, I mean, he's, he's got his money, Right. So he can sort of do what he wants. And, and he seems to really enjoy just being, you know, just the guitar, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. uh, John Bang guitar kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, man. Hey, I want to tell you about Springsteen, though, because yeah. it was, it was so freaking awesome. It, I mean, he played almost, th I was saw him in Portland. Up Oregon. He played, right? Yeah. Not Oregon. Maine. You weren't, you weren't right no. next to my house. Okay. No, no, no. I would let you know. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have been um, here. I was down in Mexico, but that's okay. That's right. Uh, well, I would have slept in your bed then. Yeah. yeah um, you could have shoveled yeah. my driveway. That would have been great. <laughs> uh, he came out, counted the band in, and pretty much they played for three hours. You know, he had a period of his career where, where, you know, he would tell stories and, you know, sure. connect on that way. He told one story and then in his last encore, he did a solo acoustic and he kind of thanked everybody, but 
it was pretty much three hours of rock and roll. And the band was killer. Uh, they debut. They're starting. The first couple of songs on this tour was pretty much the same set list, and now they're starting to roll out new songs in each in each show, which is kind of fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, but I mean, you know, what is he? Seventy three. Uh, some guys in the band are older than that, and mm. it was a three hour rock and roll show, and it was it was really, it was terrific, man. That's, I'm so glad to I, hear that. I mean, it, it you know at at some point, it, it, everyone. That, that that plays rock and roll is going to start to wane in their ability to play rock and roll. And you, and, and we as fans don't like, you know, there's always that. We, risk. we don't want that to happen. Yeah. Right, we don't want we, it to we happen. We don't witness that, but we don't want to see it. Right. Like we, we, we know it's going to happen. We want it to, to stay off as far as long as possible, but, but we definitely want those people to end on a high note, not just sort of coast out. And we've seen folks coast out. So I'm glad to hear that Springsteen is still going out and delivering. And I, my guess and, is he's pretty aware of his ability in that regard. Uh, well, I, but it's not only his ability. I mean, he's got a band. Well, the band. That, yeah, that's that, what I mean. Yeah, like the band's, his his ability with the band to go out and rock for three hours. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, some of the guys are even older than 73. And I, well, let, let me just say this. The, yeah. the thing I was most happy about was I thought there would be some ride jokes about about his age, you know, I thought he'd be like, yeah. we're still doing, you know, there's some literally nothing. He didn't go there, which I was really happy to see. It would have taken away, at least for me. Hmm. I just need, I just wanted to be in the minute let it wash over. You wanted to watch a spring scene is, show. You didn't need absolutely, to And that's what I got guys. too. Yeah. That's what I got too. And then, and then it is always funny to me whenever, you know, I see, see threads. There is strange to me musician hate for bruce i mean like not just indifference but there's like literally you know 180 degrees from from appreciating them and and sure i just don't get how any musician if you think about a guy that's kept a band together for 50 years yeah. that still releases new music at a high level that still performs at a high level i mean just if you think about your own craft and what you're what you're aiming for how you know create any kind of relevance and you know continue to cultivate that relationship with your fan base, I just don't get how there just can't be. Yeah, I mean, you can not like the song, like you said, you don't get it entirely, right? No, I don't. I don't dislike it. I mean, there's plenty of Springsteen songs I like. I, the one time I saw him, it it didn't connect. That was more because of the 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 fan base was just super weird. Uh, just like being Apple, it's like being an Macro. If you're not a if you're not a hardcore, Apple if you're fan. not a hardcore, like the fact that I wasn't a hardcore Springsteen fan, like made people made Lisa and I feel unwelcome, which was That's just, too bad. Was, yeah, it was too bad. Uh, that said, I, th he's playing here in Boston in the garden where I saw him was at Gillette stadium. So, you know, 80,000 people or something big, big place, yep. hard to get a connection, no matter who the band is, uh, you know, uh, he is playing at the Boston garden, TD garden, well, whatever the hell it's called. Um, mm -hmm. in, uh, on like March 20th, it's some Monday night. So if, the pattern persists and there are reasonably priced tickets, you know, day of or day before Lisa and I, we have it carved out on the calendar. We don't have seats, oh. but, but we may go, you know, like I'm, I still want to see him in a, a, you know, in a hockey rink. An arena. A yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I bought um, tickets right when they went on sale and I had literally, the, I've never had Springsteen tickets this far away mm. ever. Mm. Uh, we were at the top of the, that's my seats were at the top of the arena. Okay. And and this was the Ticketmaster, you know. The fiasco. Uh, the, what yeah. I believe to have been the test case for the bots as a precursor to the Taylor Swift thing. I have a whole theory about this, but that but Fair I'll, enough. I'll leave it out there. Yeah. So I paid about 300 bucks a ticket because okay. I figured he hasn't been out in six years. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that big a tour before he went to Europe. I mean, all these reasons went through my head to justify me paying more, which I, I usually wouldn't pay that much for anything. Sure. Um, but it's Springsteen but and you can't take the money with you. That's so, it. You know, that's it. I, I get it. I, I, I've, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. And that place, so literally, that place holds like 19,000 people. Uh, just so folks, big. just so folks know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a so I'm thing. watching, I'm watching, you know, seat gig and Ticketmaster and StubHub and all type of stuff. It was holding pretty good until about two days before. And then you saw it starting to go down. And literally as we were in line to go into the arena, 
I looked again and I got lower bowl for 120. So, you know, I paid 420 a seat, but I was in a, had great seats. Oh, so you upgraded and on the way in. On the way in. Good I for you. One more time. Yeah. Good for you. And I'm totally happy I did. Yep. And um, great seats, great show, great experience. I was with my buddy Bill. Nice. Everybody should have a Bill. Uh, the band chipped in for his seats for his birthday present. So That's amazing. Uh, we all chipped in, flew him up, and, and him and I went and had a great time. And uh, it it was good. Now, now the Ticketmaster thing is, is continues to be weird because all of the anxiety and anger that went out the first time that he released a set of shows now he just announced another set of shows after he comes back from europe and it's still the same thing and i don't know whether you know people are going to catch on that you don't have to play that game right uh well you don't always have to so i i've I've paid really close attention to this over the years i go see a lot of concerts and i you know i i there are shows like this springsteen one where it's not for me, mandatory to attend. Right. And mm-hmm. so I'm okay playing the game, but even for shows where I buy tickets, you know, the day they go on sale, I still watch them. Like I'm okay. Like you are realizing, Oh, if I had waited until the last minute, I could have saved 300 bucks, you know, like that yeah. kind of thing. I'm fine with it. But cause, because I like to know for next time and some shows this happens with, and some shows it goes in completely the other direction. Lately, Fish has been going down just like Springsteen. Last, you know, last minute tickets you can pick up. Fish is one of those weird bands because no the industry, like the the mainstream press of the industry doesn't talk about the fact that Fish sells out just as fast as, you know, Taylor Swift and Springsteen and all that because no one other than Fish fans actually cares, right? But mm-hmm. but they sell out just as fast. What doesn't happen is the tickets going for two grand a piece? Like P- Fish doesn't allow dynamic pricing to go that high. They do allow dynamic pricing. I don't mean to say that they're you know completely uh, uh, innocent in this, but they put a limit on the dynamic pricing. Springsteen chose not to put a limit on his dynamic pricing for that first time around, and so when the demand was huge, again, I think this was the test case for the bots that had figured out their way around Ticketmaster's system. They wanted to figure it out. They wanted to make sure it worked before they really launched it with the Taylor Swift thing. Uh, those, you know, th- the demand that was real plus the bot demand that was fake uh, drove the ticket prices up into that, you know, four or $5,000 range. Ticketmaster, and this is where it's great to follow Bob Lefsetz. Uh, Bob, yeah. yep. He did some great writing. He does, and he, and he is total. he knows how the industry works and he, yeah. he is okay telling you because what, a, what Ticketmaster's job is in part anyway, is to take the heat for things like that, that Springsteen fiasco. But the reality is Springsteen or at the very least Springsteen's management, but probably Springsteen himself was very much involved in the decision not to put a limit on those ticket prices. Right. And we've talked about this. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, like if that's truly what the market will bear, shouldn't the artist get it instead of agreed? Right. So, I have so no, bit, I have no but, problem with it, but, but did, but the market but, wouldn't bear it. It was the bots that did it th- this time around. Well, and also, I mean, you say what you want about, about Ticketmaster, but their fee is a percentage of the sales price. And so those 5,000 tickets, $5,000 right. tickets, we're getting them, what, a $500 ticket fee or something like but that. But that's all Ticketmaster so, gets. Like, they don't get a, a, a hidden cut of... But they, the, did, they didn't work any harder to sell the $5,000 ticket. Absolutely so. correct. Absolutely. Yeah, so yep. It's still, oh, it's still quite they, broken. And you wonder now that people have, have had one go round of it. Do the scalpers not buy in early? Do people say, you know... I'm going to buy this, but everybody else has got a $5,000 ticket and it's going to be a race to the bottom in the last 48 hours before as to, you know, who, who can, who can bail on these tickets. Yeah. So the, the risk on it, interestingly though, the, the fan fervor has died down. Although I don't know if you know this, but there's a um, Springsteen, it used to be a fan magazine that became a fan website, mm-hmm. 43 years loyally covering him and covering every concert. And they actually, they actually hung it up and and specifically called out that the, the, the pricing policy and the lack of the artist to stand up to it was the reason they just literally could not support that practice. And, uh, and so they 43 years, huge, huge installed reader base. And they said, no, this isn't what we signed up for and, and hung it up. So, 
But I would say the average fan, you rarely hear anybody now. You hear people say, oh, I got a pit ticket for 600 bucks and they're happy about it. Yep. So, you know, it's like many things in life that cause strife at first. You wait it out and let the fervor die down. And, you know, the people who are ticked off go away. And, you know, the people who stay find a way to rationalize their happiness. And, and That's uh, it. Yeah. No, it's it's fine. It it it's. I mean, it's a broken system, but I don't know that there's a, a, a way to fix it. I, you know what I mean? Like there is there is a a piece of simple capitalism, supply and demand involved in this. And as we've said many times here, and as you said earlier tonight, that it's better for that to go to the artist than to some some you know scalper in the middle. And and that part of the system has at least been somewhat addressed. It's not perfectly fixed, but it's been, it's been addressed and maybe it'll continue to evolve. We'll, we'll find out. Ooh, that sound means that I get to tell you about our sponsor, which today is Capo from super mega ultra groovy. This is my go-to app for learning music by ear because I mean, we all grew up with having to do it like the, the hard way. And then even when like we started to get digital tools, just regular music and video players make it really hard to move around inside a song or find exactly that right spot that you want to hear so that you can start to really sort of grok what the tune is and, and, and maybe, you know, really cop the, the one section that you got to get. Well, that's where Capo comes in. Capo gives you song learning superpowers. For precise listening, you can use Capo's transcription playhead to tackle like guitar solos or something in bite-sized chunks. And when you slow down your songs, even as slow as a quarter speed, they still sound great. And this is because Capo is built using high-end studio quality audio stretching technology. Capo also lifts chords out, detects beats, and so much more. And Capo gives you all these tools, wait for it, completely free. And really, there's no catch here. Chris, the developer of, of Capo, is fine with you using Capo's core features for free. He's betting that you'll eventually fall in love and maybe you'll want to pay extra for even more features or that you'll tell all your friends about this great free app and one of them might buy the extra features. There's no account to create, no ads, no sneaky trial subscriptions. You have nothing to lose. You go to capoapp.com or search for Capo in the App Store to download it for your Mac, your iPad or your iPhone. Again, that's Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy. Capoapp.com, C A P O A P P.com, and our thanks to Capo for sponsoring this episode. And while we're here, if you're looking for a podcast that can help get your creativity flowing and deliver a healthy dose of musical inspiration, check out the Music Production Podcast. Hosted by musician, educator, and author Brian Funk, the Music Production Podcast is a show about all things related to making music. Through informal and relaxed conversation, Brian and his guests explore the technical, creative, and philosophical sides of making music. Featuring a wide range of guests from inside, outside, and around the music industry and creative arts, the show delves deep into recording, songwriting, creativity, workflow, and artistic expression. Honest discussions about the challenges and hardships of music making often become metaphors for how we live our lives. The music production podcast can be found wherever you get your podcast or just go to brianfunk.com slash podcast. And our thanks to Brian for doing this swap with us. Hey, Dave. Hey, Paul. So I want to take you to um, house rock rehearsal with me and tell you okay. the stuff we're going to be working on this week. All right. Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I, I have, I have an important story to share about the last show, but, but go. Yeah. All right. Uh, first is Uptight by Stevie Wonder, uh -huh. which I told you we tr we tried to rehearse last week without a bass player who was had COVID, but which was a little rough. This is when we're pulling your, your out of moth balls. Doing okay? Yeah, with, he's with back. COVID. Yeah, okay, great. Great, great, great. Yeah, thank, thanks I remember that. I played Uptight with you when I when I played, yeah. when I played that gig with you. Yeah, that's right. It's cool with a big horn section. I mean, that yes. horn line pops, right? Oh, it's right? a great song. Yeah. And but it's got a groove. It's got it. You know, it's it's one of the great grooves of all time. It's got a groove. But so Uptight and Nick sings the heck out of it, so it's a good one. Yes. Next. Again, the eclecticness of the house rockers. Train in Vain by The Clash. Oh, wow. Now I'm going to ask you a question. 
uh, is is that drum track? Can you remember? Is it double tracked? Because it's it's doing kind of a funky thing on the hi hat, like a like a like a open hi hat on the on the and of four. It's not a straight beat. It actually has a really interesting groove that comes out of the drums. I don't. I, I've never. I've never covered that song before. Cue it up. Oh no, that's not. It's not as easy as you think. That this stuff <laughs> needs to be prepared, Paul. <laughs> um, let me see, let me think if I can. No, I can't. I can't cue it up. I don't right. think. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah, no, cool song. I haven't heard it covered in many other places. Great groove, fun song, great band. Yeah. Uh, so so we go from Stevie Wonder to the Clash, then we go to Billy Joel. And this is an interesting song, Keeping the Faith, which I think is off of Innocent Man. Oh, interesting. Um, so Keeping the Faith is a very useful song. It has a, a horn breakdown that works great for our band. But it's one of those poppy, happy songs that works really, really well, especially when we're playing for mixed age audiences, mm -hmm. when people want to dance with their kids, when, you know, that type of thing. Billy Joel so, does work for mixed age audiences. I mean, yeah. he, he is... He is loathed by by people, at least. Well, he's on, a pop star more than he's a rock star, right? That's right. But, however, the even the people that loathe him usually enjoy his music. Cover him. Yeah, yeah. and cover him. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You, re you really can't, like, you, you might also, you might consider You May Be Right one of those rock and roll fake book songs, right? Oh, it, I would say it's definitely one of those rock and roll fake book songs. I, yeah, I mean, he is he is a fantastic songwriter. Yeah, uh, and great piano player. And a great piano player, great singer. Like, he's got a really yep. soulful voice. I mean, he's yep. kind of a jackass, uh, at least from from mm -hmm. what I understand about him. But, you know, like, whatever. I, I don't have to eat dinner with him. I just got to enjoy Same. his music. So don't, don't yeah. yeah, I don't have any plans to invite him to dinner. That's right. Yep. So, and the only point about this, Keeping the Faith is an interesting song because it is one of those very up, poppy, peppy songs that serves pays amazing dividends in certain types of audiences. Yeah, yeah. Not not necessarily a great dive bar band song, although maybe, I guess, at the right time, right? Sure. But definitely in songs of... That vibe is, is a really useful vibe to set. I mean, there are many useful vibes to set, depending upon what the instruments are like in your hands, but that one really works for us. That type of vibe is great. All right, right, next is Walk the Dinosaur by Was Not Was. Oh, Yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot so, about that song. Yeah, yeah, yep. and an another good funky song, another great horn line, super line. Yeah, that's a great tune. Next, "Stay with Me" by the Faces. Oh, I love that tune. That's a fun. Oh. That's a really fun tune to play. Yeah, everybody gets a chance in that song to shine, yep. right? Yeah, you got to the guitar's got to be in that open E tuning to really get the that that full sounding vibe. Um, and if you get that I, right, I, you say that as a guitar player, it doesn't matter. I've played that. Ooh. No, the groove, like that song has so much energy in it that it doesn't matter. And, and I say that as someone who has played that song with guitar players that don't retune their guitar. And also, I, you know, that gig that I talked about with, uh, at, in Vegas, the Foo Fighters gig where, where Jay from Bombay crowd surfed and it turned mm -hmm. into this whole drunken frat party. That the highlight of the evening was a 15 minute rendition of Stay With Me that Taylor yeah. Hawkins sang. Yeah. And it, it was an off the cuff decision. Dave did not change guitars. He looked at Taylor and was like, yeah, clearly asked him, You you want to do Stay With Me? And Taylor oh, was like, Yeah. And and they just played it. And it's great. I mean, it yes, there is that sort of classic guitar sound. But just like all those Stones tunes that are in, you know, Open G or whatever, yes, like they, yes, to a guitar player, they sound better and they sound more correct in their proper tuning. But the the reality is, it doesn't freaking matter. Well, you I think the song play, is great. You go play the song, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you do go play the song, but it is very much like the Stones. And you're getting you're getting a low end out of your chords. That's just a little bit different. That, Again, and it, it, and it, it matters to the guitar player, and <laughs> and that can matter to the performance, right? Like if you're comfortable playing it, and you've got a different vibe, you might play it a different way. It, it like that. I, I don't mean to be dismissive of that from that angle, but from the other side of the stage, nobody cares. All right, I'll, I'll let you have that one. You can play brown um, sugar in in standard tuning, and people still love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it more if, if the guitars play it right. So, well, that's that's not correct, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. So uh, stay with me. You know, if you have a five piece band, two guitars, yeah, key, keys, bass, and drums, it is a, it is, God, it rocks. It's it so rocks. Great. No, that song is a blast to play. We used to play that as a, a sound check song for, uh, for the last, I mean, it's been a couple of years, but for the last run of Hedwig that I did, we, we had two guys, our two guitar players were massive Stones fans, like both of them. And, uh, it, but also fans of classic rock. So our sound checks became just extended classic rock song. Like oh. what, what songs from the fake book do we know? And mm-hmm. let's just play that. And whoever wants to sing it, sings it, you know? And so stay with me wound up being kind of uh, one that, that repeated itself, uh, which was rare. Most of the time it was like, all right, what haven't we played? But occasionally. Stay well, I mean, it's also, that's, that. that's yeah. Rod Stewart is prime and he's, he's oh, yeah. up there. Right. So yeah. not everybody can sing that thing. No, so. it's, I, I had to sing it for the, for the Woo. sound checks. Yeah. I mean, it didn't matter because, you know, other than the people, you know, washing the seats in the theater, no, nobody was there to watch, but um, still like it's, it's up there. Taylor Hawkins sang the hell out of that. Uh, it, he's a talented he cat was sadly was a talented. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right. Two anyway, more. Yep. We are a, a party band, so we need party songs. Save a horse, ride a cowboy. Love that tune. Yep. It's a great tune. And what we do, you know, there's when the band kicks in, there's kind of like a banjo, you know, yes. vibe to it. Yeah. We have a great horn arranger who, who put a killer brassy, nasty horn, a part over this and uh, and it also you know the the stops it makes the, the stops pop quite a bit ah. great song everybody has a good time in that song one more what's the last one and i mixed on it so we got to talk about it for a second all right okay zz top cheap sunglasses oh yeah i think we played that in the Macworld all-star band uh, i don't recall that so again maybe oh sharp dressed man sorry i played cheap yeah. sunglasses in fling that's right yeah 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 so again, there's a to really get it right and to get those unique guitar parts out. There is, you know, it's a the high E is tuned down to D, yep. and you actually hear those notes in those chords. You know, like that little bell train sounding thing. You actually do hear those notes. So, and then the other thing is the tr- proper way to play that guitar part uh, is kind of a hybrid picking thing where you're kind of skipping a string and you're yes. you know, you're picking a low string and then you're getting a you're getting a higher string, not you know a D string or G string that rings out. That is the mojo of that song, though. So, yes, you can play it as power chords. And, you know, like you're saying, most people won't know. But if if you really want to get the cool sound out of the song that makes it a cool song, that's what you do. However, no, no, the thing that makes that song cool is the drum fill in the middle of the guitar <laughs> riff, right? Right? Like, that's what makes it cool. Potato, potato, brother. Uh, but, I couldn't but resist. But that is one that, like... It is a, you got to place it in the right place in the uh-huh. set. It's, you know, it is, and it has to groove. I mean, it has well, to be Well, that's the thing out. about that song is it, it, so much of it is spent in that sort of groovy space where there's no lyrics. There's almost no solo happening, right? So if the groove isn't happening, that song falls apart hard. And you got to well, there is a guitar solo, but there's a really funky but it's rhythm that guitar funky, underneath it. Correct, and that almost yeah. drives more than the solo, right? Like it, like it just that has to be there. And if if the band can't hold the groove together, it's a disaster. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Agree. yeah. You have to be comfortable at that tempo. Yes, and you have to you know stay right there. Yes. and again, Hassan, my horn arranger, he's adding some. Not he won't overdo it, but you know, I think probably that that train horn sounding thing. That'll probably become a horn lick or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't like you know that. Eh, 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 I you know interested yeah. to see if he if he adds a Barry Sax onto that line. So I mean it, it'll be fun to see what Hassan does with it. But that's one that our bass player wanted to sing. It's you know definitely a classic rock classic yeah. song, yeah. but it is it is a a very specific tempo and groove to go over. And you know I wouldn't put it. In most cases, I wouldn't put it like three quarters of the way through your show where, no. where everything's cruising. And, you know, no, it's, maybe a tough, early- it's a tough tune. We, like I said, we did it in Fling for a while when we were playing a bunch of covers. And there were nights that it absolutely slayed. And there were nights where it fell flat. And I, it, like I, I think it was very much, you know, three beats Placement. per minute. 
Well, the tempo of it too. Like if you're just a little bit fast on that, man, it doesn't work. And, and, and feels si- rushed. Similarly, if it's a little bit slow, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't have the energy. So yeah, it's a, I, I, I never used a, a metronome to count off tunes with fling, but, but if I did, that would have been one of the songs where I, I, you know, just made sure to lock in on a, a tempo before counting it in because it, and it, it you're stuck with it. it you, Cause yeah. like you said, you can't move it. You start speeding it up or slowing it down. That song falls apart even faster. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I've actually played with drummers, obviously not you, that at those, I, that's not even mid tempo. It's actually, you know, what is that? Probably mm-hmm. 75 mm-hmm. beats per minute, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It might be a hundred. Take me anyway, to the river. N- yeah, I think it's about a hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I played with drummers who get very uncomfortable trying to keep that tempo if they don't sense it's going over. And they start searching a little faster, a little slower, right? Yes. And that, that you know, that's that's a that's a semi pro band characteristic, right? Like trying to save a song instead of committing to exactly what it is and just seeing it out to the end. But searching for a tempo mid song, I think is a, it's, it's 96, a, it's a losing, 96 beats per minute. Is nice that count, man. Oh, thanks man. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, I think that's a losing strategy to kind of try and save a song by changing tempo. Um, mid song with that song. Yes. Uh, there, there are well, songs, yeah, some songs speed up health- healthily. Yeah. Like su- how many super- songs slow down healthily? No, you're right. Superstition is a great song to speed up. If, if you want to pour gas on the fire, it works amazing. September. Well. September, well, September, which does it itself, right? Yeah. Right in the intro. I think that was a mistake in the, in the recording studio, but yes, <laughs> it does. It, it bumps up five beats per minute, right when the horns come in. Um, and then another one is, is you can't always get what you want. Like mm. there are times when th- that tune, obviously by the stones, for those of you who didn't catch the reference, uh, it works really well to just hold firm on the tempo and keep it in that groove, but equally works as well. Just letting it at every turnaround, just like superstition, just let it go. Let it go. Let a little more out on the reins, a little more out on the reins each time around. And it's cooking by the end and it's, it can be great. So anyway, you just came to rehearsal with me. Thanks. Thanks man. Yeah, no, it was good. Hey, so speaking of rehearsal, uh, I I had a, a tantrum at a recent fling rehearsal. You? Uh, I oh yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not proud of this, but but I, I was at the uh fish shows, one of them, I don't remember which one, down in Mexico. Talk about shows that you overpay for, right? I mean, that's uh, like sort of just part of the deal. Uh and this was, I believe this was the first time that all four band members in Fish were on in ears. Uh I, if, if you have been listening long enough, three years ago, I came back from seeing them in Mexico. It was the first time Trey Anastasia was wearing ears. Uh, and then, and then obviously COVID shut everything down and, and it took him a while to come back around to using ears, which happened this summer. Uh, John Fishman, the drummer, I believe Mexico this, this week was the, the first time he was also on ears. So all four band members on ears and they were constantly motioning to their, monitor engineer to tweak things it's you know fine i mean i i commend them for staying on their ears all four nights like nobody pulled one out like it was you know these are the things you notice as a as a music nerd right um it better for their hearing in the end probably better for their ability to actually hear during the show but it is an adjustment and just watching them even you know and this was probably the third night that i had this epiphany um that I'm about to share, but you know, watching them still tweaking it. it's like, I mean, they've, they did sound checks every day. They've played literally two full nights of music and they still need to tweak their ears. People on stage must be like changing their gains. And that's when it hit me. We were in the middle of a fling rehearsal. I mentioned in the last show that the fling gig we played at the stone church, I had the best in-ear mix. I one of the best in-ear mixes I've ever had. I don't know if it was actually the best, but it was up there. I didn't have to adjust things. Things sounded great all night. It, it was fantastic. And I didn't think much of it other than we had a, you know, skilled sound engineer and, uh, you know, it was just a good night. Like check the box. Great. You know, I'll, I'll take it. But watching Fish go through this where the guys are constantly tweaking things all night and realizing, well, it must be that 
you know, gains are changing on stage. And then that changes the ears, which of course is something you've lamented many times. It reminded me of the tantrum I threw at our rehearsal before this gig. And again, I'm not proud of throwing a tantrum, but sometimes it happens. We're not perfect people. Uh, we were playing and uh, everybody at, at this point in fling, especially at that particular rehearsal was going direct into the board. And, and I'm not going to call, I'm not going to identify uh, people cause it doesn't really matter. But uh, early on in the rehearsal, maybe second song in or something, uh, someone adjusted their gain up substantially. And as we've learned on this show, Dave, I think Davis Thurston was uh, the sound engineer and, and video guru was the, uh, was the most recent one to say it. When there are ears on stage, you don't mess with gains because it can be really dangerous. And I, I, I as soon as this happened, I like, I heard like my ears just like, you know, it was, it was like, like 10 times louder in my ears, this one instrument. And I ripped my ears out and stopped. I'm like, what the hell was that? And I freaked out about it. Cause it was like, first of all, I was, I was shocked and also pissed that that happened. And secondly, it was like, this has happened a couple of times over the past 18 months with fling. And I'm going to, I'm going to take this, this frustration and, and anger and I'm going to make sure that this message is not lost on anyone. So <laughs> I, I freaked out about it. Well, clearly I need, I had, I had tried to com convey this idea that you don't mess with gains. If you need to hear yourself more in the monitor, or in your ears, when you're going direct, you ask for more in the monitor. You don't just give more freaking gain to the whole system. And I've tried to communicate this in, in a variety of ways. I thought I was successful. Clearly I was not. And so I took this moment where I suddenly had everybody's attention and, and went a little bit farther with it than I probably needed to go. But I'm not convinced of that because in the end, and again, there would have been a better way to get this point across, but in the end, it got the point across and not a single person touched their gains during that entire gig at the church. Everybody got their gains set when we sat down, you know, and, and went through sound check. And nobody touched their gains at any point during the gig. And I'll remind you at the last show, during the last episode, I mentioned how great my in-ear mix was. How great, I think Russ was the only other one on in-ears. He commented too. He's like, that was amazing. Well, gains weren't changing on stage throughout. If somebody needed more, they simply asked for more from the engineer yeah. and got it. And I really think that makes a huge difference. Uh, and, and it's I, like, there's a lesson here for all of us, even if we know this fundamentally, intellectually, the experience of having gains that don't change makes, I, and even Aaron, who uh, our, our keyboard player, who was on um, monitor wedge all night, you know, a, just a traditional out loud wedge. He was like, that was the best monitor mix I've ever had. And it's like, okay, so wait a minute, this, uh, this impacts everything. If you can keep stage volume consistent all night, which when you're going direct is, is a like you, you can guarantee to keep it consistent as long as nobody turns up their gains. So, you know, it seems like the last mile of success here is, you know, people having an app to mix themselves and giving themselves more gain in their ears like that. Giving even, themselves more level in their ears, leaving their, yeah, their, yeah, their, yeah, their, yeah. their sins alone. More level. Yeah, yeah. More level. Oh yeah. But even if you don't, have the app just ask the monitor engineer to do it. I mean, it's not that hard well, to just ask, it, you know, come up with a, a signal system with your monitor engineer and and do it. Like, it's yeah. just not that hard. No, it's not that hard. Although my response to that is I have more experiences of monitor engineers not paying attention or, 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 front of, or there only being one engineer. If, there, if there's a, engineer. yeah. Yeah. Having a front of house engineer mix ears is tough. Even if they are, um, you know, it, very skilled at mixing ears, you're, you're in the wrong place to do it visually. Yeah. It doesn't work. No, I, I've, I've had that experience too. Uh, you know, when I watched, when I went to see that band goose and we had a long conversation about it after I did, the one thing I didn't mention was every one of the musicians on stage on their mic stand had, it, it wasn't an, an iPad. It looked like one of those um, Axiom things like you see in recording studios or whatever, but, yeah. but they had their own 
like their ability to adjust their own mix, not just more me, more everybody. Like you could tweak your mix all night long. And I watched them do it occasionally. What, you know, somebody be be playing or saying they'd reach down and just make a quick adjustment. And it was no big deal. It didn't distract them from the show. And they got to have exactly the mix they wanted all night long. I, 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 there's not a, it's, it's not a big deal to have that with you on stage. That's what I've done. It's just like, just have it on your mic stand. Just reach down, you know, and you can do it with an iPad or a, even a cheap tablet usually. Yeah. So I don't know. I, but there's, there's something to be said for, you know, leave those gains alone. Uh, there's a lot to be said for it. Yeah. Like it's perhaps one of the most important fundamental lessons to have. And I, well, it's I, just a selfish assumption that you turning you up, so you get yours and everybody else runs gets, their trouble gets anyway. yours too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. the problem. It's like, how do you, and, and and that was where some of my frustration came from and, and it fueled my tantrum was how do you think that you doing that doesn't impact everybody else? Whether it's, whether people are on ears or just listening out loud. I mean, if you're turning yourself up, it's going to impact everything. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's a, Sort of how physics yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. No so, doubt. so let, let my tantrum be the only tantrum that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Share this segment with your, uh, with your bandmates. And maybe even if they don't want to listen to you, cause my bandmates certainly didn't want to listen to me until I had a tantrum. Maybe your bandmates will listen to me cause they don't know me and they think I'm, you know, I actually know what I'm talking about. Cause I, I, uh, do a, publish a podcast. So, you know, that's funny. <laughs> so, um, I have, I have a house rocker gig on Saturday night, a private gig. I have a coffee house gig on Friday night. And the weather's been miserable here. So my outdoor Sunday afternoon gig, it's cold, it's rainy. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of gigs getting canceled this winter. I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I, I do know. The, I, the, I, I, yes. <laughs> if we well, a lot we of, see that a lot here. Yeah, for sure. Well, that, that's the thing. We don't see it a lot here. Right, and and right. that's the, we, we get more months out of our gigging calendar than most places do. Way and more. And so I, yeah. I'm somewhat philosophical that it's just our time this winter, and that's okay. Um, but the gig I'm very excited to share with you that I'm looking going to look forward to doing a show about, on St. Patrick's Day, I'm playing with a small combo of people playing Irish traditional music. Uh, uh, for an Irish St. Patrick's Day party. Um, one of the guys is, you know, he's the real deal. My friend Steve Kritzer is a mandolin. Oh, actually, he's, he's pretty much any stringed instrument player. Okay. But uh, he's going to be the leader of the, of the band. I'm going to sing about a third of the song. He's going to sing the rest. Russ from the House Rockers previously is going to be, I don't know, actually know what he's going to bring. You know, he, he might bring that contraption that's part cajon, part congas you know he, he's going to decide what to bring yeah the you know the irish conga of course and then um uh <laughs> bass ba- bass player and, and a and a fiddle player so i am really excited to play some totally out of the box different music at, yeah. at a party like that great sing-along song if you know if you're irish i mean you'll know when irish Irish smiling you know danny boy people will be singing along hopefully in the spirit that saint patrick intended them to and uh, th- so that's uh, that's coming up pretty soon. I'm excited about it. Amazing. Yeah. Fling has uh, on Friday night of this week, we are playing and I think it'll happen. There's a snowstorm coming. We're supposed to get about 10 inches of snow, but I think Ooh. it starts right after I would like get home from this gig. So uh, like, I-, I think the gig will happen. We're doing a benefit at uh, a local uh, restaurant and wine bar here in Durham, a benefit for an organization called Women Aid which is a local organization that, that um, raises money and then distributes it to people and families in need. It's a great, it's a great organization. And uh, we get to play in their little, in this restaurants in Chow's little um, basement wine bar, which should be, should be fun. Um, I, in fact, I was building the set list while, uh, while I was getting ready for, uh, for this show. So I got to finish that afterwards. But, um, but then, then I'm off to, well, I head to Vegas next week for, podcast movement and then right from vegas i go straight to austin for south by southwest so we will almost certainly record our next episode while i'm on the road in austin and um depending on when we record when we record it i might have some interesting things to share or uh might have some interesting interesting plans to share but uh yeah good uh, i look forward to it yeah yeah same so we march on we march on yeah nicely done there with the whole march thing that was that was 
I don't know if you meant that, but you know, of course they did. Yeah, I know you did. I, I don't know if I'm happy that you meant that. That's more what mm-hmm. I was trying to say. Yeah. No. Yeah. But you said it anyway. So there you go. You know, we march on. You got anything else today, man? No, brother. Good episode. Yep. Good talking to you. Yeah. Glad you're back safe. Glad you had a good time. Yeah. And, and same. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we both had, uh, we had some, you know, those experiences that, that fuel us for the live music we're going to create. So there you go. There you go. Inspiration. Good stuff. Inspiration. Makes me, you know what? It makes me always want to be performing. Yeah. Doesn't it though? You got to have those reminders. Thanks for hanging out, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We've actually got some of your feedback to address, uh, hopefully in the next episode, and, and keep sending it in. 